Welcome everyone. In the episode number 2, we've learned what money is. We've had grasped it shortly through its formal definition but mostly through its three main functions. Good if you've watched the episode number 2. You'll still survive in case you haven't. Today, we'll see how and what the money was invented for. For that, I'll tell you a little story. Imagine an island with only two living souls, Barry and Anna. Barricade has good hunting skills, helpful when it comes to catching seagulls. He's also good at finding potable water thanks to his ability to crack coconuts like nobody. Turning to Anagram, she's pretty good with sticks. She can build shelters and make spears that Barry would use for hunting seagulls. Both need each other as much to feed themselves and to survive. To make our exercise simple, we'll consider that, when they deal and trade with each other, the overall value of their work is equivalent at end of each year. In this case, they simply need to agree on values for their products so that their exchanges can be regular and acceptable by both. They would then agree on some kind of conversion table, to determine and know how much one thing is worth in another. By the way, you've understood, this is simply the principle of barter. The main problem in a barter economy is the need for double coincidence of wants. Back to Anna and Barry, they would keep records of those transactions to know who owes what. With only two persons, each having only two types of goods to offer, the table's already repelling. How ugly would it look with a hundred persons having as many types of goods to offer? Yep. Not very practical. To make life easier in their exchanges, Anna and Barry create a money they decided to call the shell. Guess what they chose to materialize their money? Shells. My imagination wasn't that prolific at this point. Now, they only need to exchange shells. And it becomes greatly simpler. For a start, they agree to share 100 shells each. From that time, the shells are circulating from one to the other. This allows them to give a value of conversion to everything. They end up agreeing on something. A shelter is valued 20 shells, a harpoon 10 shells, a seagull 4 shells and an open coconut 2 shells. In such case, they would no longer need to keep records of those exchanges. Remember. For simplicity, we'll consider that the total value of the work Barry and Anna have produced and traded with each other at end of each year is equivalent. So, at end of each year, each one of them has 100 shells, because Barry bought 3 shelters for 60 shells and 4 harpoons for 40 shells. But at the same time, he sold to Anna 10 seagulls for 40 shells and 30 coconuts for 60 shells. So that's it. A money that works perfectly. Thank you folks. See ya. Eeeh. Almost. I did not mention it, but you could sense that there's something crucial with this system of shells. You understood that this whole system is based on trust. If one of our two participant characters discreetly introduces extra shells, then the other one gets robbed. If trust disappears and one of them no longer accepts shells then the system collapses instantly and it is the one who has the most shells in hands that gets robbed by the other. Isn't it the same for our actual currencies? Exactly, and precisely the same. That's why it's called fiat currency. Having value only because the government declares so and minted out of any valuable commodity, such as gold or silver. Now let's add a layer of complexity to our story. Let's consider that after one year, Anna and Barry become more efficient in their work and they start producing twice as much. They then take advantage of it to increase their lifestyle by also consuming twice as much. At the current price, Barry and Anna no longer have enough shells to exchange their productions. Yet, they still have things to trade. So there in fact they end up with a problem that is purely monetary. Does it mean that when we're told money's going to be created in order to create growth, someone's actually going to get scammed? Eeh, yep. Anyway, we also understood another thing. That productivity is defined as the quantity of things produced over the same amount of time. 
In our illustration, the second year, each of our two friends produces twice as much. In such case, we say that the annual productivity has doubled. Back to our monetary problem, our two friends will then have only two options. Option 1, they keep the same money supply being exchanged between them, and in such case, they simply divide all the prices by two. Considering that everything costs half as much, Anna and Barry have again, enough money to continue to exchange their increased production. Option 2, they use two times more shells to find a balance between the new number of things produced and the new amount of money in circulation. Let's look together at option 1, where Anna and Barry simply divide all prices by two while the quantity of the shells in circulation does not change. Few things to understand in this case. First, when productivity increases, prices should fall if we do not touch the money supply. In our modern world, productivity is constantly increasing. That's why we say that capitalism is by nature deflationary. Agriculture is a very obvious example. In the 19th century a farmer could feed three persons with his work. Today a farmer feeds about a hundred persons. In such case, productivity has been multiplied by 30. Secondly you also need to retain that when the value of a money increases, it means that the prices go down. We say in such case that the money appreciates. In our example when we divide the prices by two, the shell has appreciated. Its value has increased, considering that from the second year, each shell buys twice as much things as the previous year. Thirdly, a deflationary economy rewards savings. The more the money appreciates, the more its purchasing power increases. So even if I simply stack my money, my purchasing power will increase. In this case, no need for banks or investment to yield a profit. Hold on, you said you would explain how money works. You first say that prices should go down as technology advances, when in reality everyone knows that prices keep going up. Then, you mention the deflation as something nice, whereas all politics and the economists want to fight it. E. Yes, true. That's because currently our economy is not working as it should. But we'll come back on that. Let's look at option two. Scenario where the prices don't change, but we double the number of shells, right? Yes. In this case, if Anna makes an effort to save some of her shells the previous year, she does not benefit from the increase in productivity, since the prices do not move. Assuming that she saved two shells, she would still buy one coconut from one year to the next. Worse. Both, Anna and Barry will have 100 new shells. That means that both will benefit in the same way from productivity gains, regardless of their savings. In other words, whether they've been spenders or savers, they'll be treated the same way. On the other hand, not everything is negative in this scenario, given that prices do remain stable. Okay, but the prices still do not increase. Again, true. But at the same time, if I could explain everything about creation of money in less than 10 minutes, then I would be telling you a lot of stupidities. So let's meet in the next episode. Meanwhile, subscribe and share this video if you liked it.